I was talking about the sedimentation analysis in the previous lecture and this is where I went very fast all right. So, whatever you do in the lab if you can tell me that this has already been done in the lab I can skip that portion. So, I can save time all right or I can modulate it in such a manner that uh, I can do justice with the course as well as the time. So, I am sure you are doing these experiments in the lab. So, I need not to discuss much. So, here we have talked about uh, the assumptions all right and uh, then we were deriving uh, a relationship based on the fact that uh, you know in hydrometer tests what happens is you take w weight of the soil and put it in the v volume and you use a hydrometer here and normally at this point you know we measure the density of suspension and uh, this is treated as l the length time is known because you must have done these experiments I am sure in the lab you have done or not you have done half of the batch. Okay. So, every subsequent time you keep on finding out the readings which are depicted as hydrometer reading as r normally r increases from 0 to some number depending upon the type of hydrometer you are using. I have talked about the corrections which are applied for hydrometer readings uh, that is the meniscus the application of uh, you know corrections for <coughs> dispersing agent and I have also talked about the displacement of fluid because of the hydrometer. So, these are the three corrections which you normally apply temperature correction meniscus correction and displacement of fluid because of the hydrometer some of them are additive some of them are negative and then you apply and get the readings uh, this is what the philosophy of the whole test is. Now, what you should be doing is uh, see it is a very interesting uh, application in most of these <coughs> production engineering related jobs where you are working with slurry. particularly those of you who might apply for uh, a position with the hydrocarbon industry drilling fluids all right oil and uh, natural gas hydrocarbons and all those things. So, normally they do this type of work where they talk about the density of the slurry and uh, what you should be proving is if I want to find out the unit weight of the slurry. Now, this would be what I can measure the unit weight of slurry by using a hydrometer or I can find out the total volume of the solids which I have used plus volume of water. <coughs> and I can assume that the total volume of the system is unity. And based on this I can derive uh, the total unit weight would be w upon v and this w upon v would be having components as volume of solids I think you can compute this would be w upon v over g into gamma w is this ok. is this correct nice and then have you have the volume of water. So, 1 minus volume of water would be equal to this term. Now, how would you compute the volume of water that is a big question is it not. 
So, volume of water I can compute either if I take this on this side. So, this will be 1 minus this. And then if you do some computations to compute the weight of the water, what I will have to do? I will have to multiply this by gamma w this whole term. Now, when we do with deal with the hydrometer, the concept here is the density of the fluid keeps on changing with respect to time. So, if I define this as gamma i, where gamma i is the initial density, initial unit weight I will write of the slurry. And remember if I am using a hydrometer, I am getting the value of gamma slurry corresponding to this point. So, this I can measure, this I can compute, I can do both the things. If I leave this against the in the gravity over a period of time, what is going to happen? The density of the suspension is going to change from let us say 0 to z and this is how the profile of unit weight will look like. So, this is the time dependent unit weight of the slurry. So, if I go back to the calculation which I was doing over here and if I say gamma i equal to try to prove this once you have these expressions, you can define this as w upon v g minus 1 over g. Now, the concept which I was discussing in the last lecture is at this point, which is at a depth of z, if I consider a plane which is of thickness d z. Now, what hydrometer is going to do is, it is going to give the density of the slurry at this point. So, what I am assuming or what in physical sense is correct is that all the particles which are finer than d fraction, okay, less than d size. d is the particle size, they will not be present in this column of water. Is this okay? So, because of the settlement or because of sedimentation process, when the gamma is changing from here to here, the particle less than d size will not be available. All right. Now, we call this as a percentage finer than. Now, if I use the term n for defining what is the fraction of particles which are less than d, what I have to do is I have to multiply here by n. Because n into w takes care of the percentage of the particles which are finer than d and these this d if you remember is a function of critical velocity or terminal velocity. All right. I can also use a function that v can be defined as L by t if required. So, gamma i at an instant would be equal to gamma z, because this is what you are measuring at this point. All right. Gamma z minus gamma w is sometimes defined as r. Now, r is the hydrometer reading.
So, that means gamma z can also be written as 1 plus r times gamma w. So, this gamma w is just for the balancing, so that this becomes a density term w upon v is a density term. So, I am just writing 1 plus r into gamma w, where r is the hydrometer reading. So, if r is let us say 0 0.025, the specific gravity would be 1.025 multiplied by gamma w, this becomes the density of the slurry. Is this okay? Is this fine? You must have done this in your lab. I can prove from here that n equal to r times g over g minus 1 into w upon v oh sorry this will be v upon w I spend half an hour whenever you get time try to prove all these functions and see whether you can derive this or not from hydrometer analysis what we wanted to do is we wanted to get the n n is the fraction of the particles which are less than d diameter is this okay the specific gravity of the soil is known volume of the suspension is known how much weight of the soil mass has been used is known r you are measuring from the hydrometer reading you get the value of n and this n can be plotted again on this scale if you remember. So, last time the scale on which I plotted this is x axis is normally a log scale and this is the graph which you get. I do not know whether you are being taught this or not in the laboratory. This analysis is done on the fine fraction where we are filtering out 475 micron particle size. the rest of the analysis was done on the coarse fraction. So, now you have to join both the graphs. So, it is as if suppose if I take the x amount of the soil out of which after filtering from 475 micron I will be getting x coarse and x fine all right. So, this curve I can obtain from sieve analysis which I was discussing in the last lecture percentage finer than log of the diameter not log of the sorry it is on a log scale not the log of the diameter x fine I am going to get from here and the inbuilt assumption is this n finer is less than d. So, you club the two graphs and get the complete particle size distribution curve. Many people do the mistake in assimilating the information from the two tests <coughs> all right. So, this part sit down and practice the problems which I will be giving you today and try to solve them. How many of you following uh, a book on soil mechanics? Very good, which one? Excellent. So, what are problems which are solved there? At least solve them. There are a lot of example problems they have given and uh, try to be conversant with this. Any questions here? Yes, please. Sorry? Let expression of V solution. With this one? Yeah. 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 V solution. You know, weight volume of the solids can be computed this much is the w upon v and what about this g into w this is the unit weight of the total suspension and g into gamma w is the density of the solids which are present. So, this is how I am getting the solids. Total suspension means? Total suspension volume will be unity say 1000 cc. So, volume of solids plus volume of water how will you compute the volume of solids? So, if I know the total weight of the soil which I have added in 
certain volume V divided by G into gamma W. So, this is the component which gives you the dry component of the solids which are in the suspension form. So, this becomes the solids. So, and hence you can compute 1 minus gamma W equal to this or V W will be this expression. Weight of water I can compute by using multiplying this system by gamma W. So, this becomes the weight of the water. That V is the total volume. Total yeah, total volume of the cylinder in which you have taken the suspension. So, normally what you do is you take 50 gram of the soil in 1000 cc. So, this V becomes 1000 cc. Now, what we have done is uh, we have talked about uh, the particle size distribution analysis for coarse grain and fine grain soils. Now, moving on to the classification of the soils, yeah. Oh, hydrometer reading is I will tell you, these are the graduations on the hydrometer stem. So, if you go to the lab next time and when you perform these experiments, you will observe that if the hydrometer is like this, this is the stem of the hydrometer and this is the body of the hydrometer all right. And then the bottom motion is filled up with lead balls. This is the CG of the thing. <coughs> R is the graduation on the hydrometer. So, 0 to 20. So, this is the R value. It is okay. what you read in real life, because you have asked this question. So, I will explain this further. As the suspension process goes on in the hydrometer column, what will happen to R? It will increase or it will decrease? Sorry, think again. Look at this density distribution. So, when you started with a initial density of gamma i and then you left the cylinder for settlement, what is going to happen? All the particles are settling down. So, top portion of the liquid column is become lighter, is becoming lighter, all right. So, if this becomes lighter, what happens to R? it goes up all right. So, r equal to 0 will indicate 1 into gamma w is the gamma i is the unit weight of water. So, okay. Now, why we have studied this particle size distribution for the coarse and fine grained soils is because we wanted to characterize them, classify them. So, now I will be moving on to the classification system for soils particularly fine grained soils. And What we do normally is we use the term known as Atterberg limit. Have you done this in the lab? Atterberg limits? Not yet. We talk about several indices. This part of the subject is slightly monotonous, but factual. So, you have to remember these things. You see, as I said in the first lecture or second lecture, soil is something uh, which changes its characteristics when it comes in contact with water. So, suppose if I start from a dry soil mass and if I add water to this. 
what is going to happen. The state of material keeps on changing. So, from dry it will become semi solid and if I further add water from semi solid it will become plastic and if I further keep on adding water to this, this will become liquid and all this is happening just by addition of moisture. The interfaces between these states are known as the indices or Atterberg limits. So, these are defined as <coughs> you know this will be liquid limit in other words this is the minimum amount of water which is present in the system when the soil just starts behaving like liquid all right this is what is known as a plastic limit Those of you who are good in making clay potteries or artifacts normally use this concept of keeping these indices intact unknowingly. You are good at making artifacts, who is good? So, you take dry soil and start adding water. So, state of the material keeps on changing, all right. And this is what is known as shrinkage limit. Though these indices look very primitive, but they have lot of applications in science and technology. In the second course, when I will be teaching what we will be talking about the shear strength, that means this is the limit of the moisture content beyond which the system starts flowing, it has no shear strength of its own, yes. Yeah. Sir, can you write in bigger fonts please? Can I write in bigger fonts? <laughs> okay. All right, sure. If I dictate that is better, okay. I will try to follow what you are saying. See, liquid limit is the limit beyond which the soil behaves is this okay behaves like a flowable material that means the minimum possible shear strength In laboratory normally uh, what we do is we use a Casagrande apparatus, you must have seen it. How many of you have performed this experiment? No, not anybody. So, there is a cup sort of a thing, and there is a flat platform. In this cup, it is a made up of brass, we fill the soil and then with the help of a spatula, we make a small groove. So, we remove this much portion of the soil and then what we do is we allow this cup to fall on the platform and several tamps we give tamping. Now, because of the tamping process, what happens is these two cleavages which have got created, they tend to get filled up. We call this as a caving in, particularly in case of tunnels. Now, this is the limit when these two cleavages they just try to close up, uh, at this point we find out the liquid limit. So, what we normally do is we plot percentage moisture 
as a function of n. This n is also on the log scale. Remember, these are the log scales, these are not the log of the number, all right. So, the logic says the more the moisture, you require less number of blows, we call this as the blows or tamps. Okay. So, more the moisture, less number of blows are required to close the cleavage which you have created. However, as you keep on increasing the number of blows and the moisture content decreases, if I find out at n equal to 25, what is the moisture content? Now, this is what corresponds to liquid limit. All right. This is one way to characterize the soil. These are ancient ways of classification, but they are still valid and people are using them and uh, these are just like Brahma Vakyas. You have to follow it if you have to classify. So, we have obtained the liquid limit. Normally, we define liquid limit as W L. Sometimes, we write it as L L also. So, this is the liquid state of the material. The next state is the plastic limit. What we do is uh, take the soil, add water and roll it on a <coughs> this is a plate made up of glass, glass sheet. So, make threads of soil by mixing water to the soil and you roll it in this way, you know just using your fingertips and convert the soil mass into very thin 3 mm diameter threads. The logic behind using your fingers for remolding this to this state is your body has some heat. So, truly speaking when we roll it on a glass sheet, we are imparting lot of heating by your body heat. And at the same time we are trying to convert this material into a thread. So, this is the plasticity, how plastic the material is clear. So, this is the state of the material which defines how easily the material can be remolded into a plastic state. When these threads start, start crumbling, you find out the moisture content by putting these threads in oven and finding out the moisture content and this moisture content will correspond to the plastic limit. And sometimes we define this as P L. Now, if you want to understand what is the concept of shrinkage limit, you have to be a bit focused on the board. The guys who are working in the field of let us say Unilever type of people who are designing cosmetics, different types of toiletries and all, Colgate, Palmolive, all right, anything which is flowable, where the minerals you want to flow by applying a pressure, we call this as extrusion process. I would be working in the range of the moisture which is allowing material to flow, rheology becomes important. So, those of you who might get a chance to work in the field of let us say dredging industry, where you want to create artificial islands and you want to create a paste of the soil and you want to throw it, all right, the way you do uh, paintings on the wall. That is also a good example of rheology of paints and varnishes. So, their liquid limit becomes important. Plastic limit is sculptures, making pottery and so on. So, this is the model which is normally used. If I plot total volume of the soil with respect to the moisture content, all right, it so happens that up to a certain limit of moisture, the volume does not change. 
and beyond this there is a linear variation in the volume of the soil. Now, this is where I can define the three indices. The first one is liquid limit, this is your plastic limit and this is shrinkage limit. All right. One of the interpretations of these graphs is if I extend this portion back and if I find out the intercept on the volume axis, this is the volume of the solids. Clear? So, to complete this discussion, anything below the shrinkage limit is going to be in the dry state. Now, if I translate it over here, this is going to be the dry state of the material, this is going to be the semi solid state of the material, this is going to be the plastic state of the material and this is the liquid state of the material. Normally, these tests are done starting from right hand side. So, you make a slurry of the soil and start drying it. So, you are traversing opposite to the moisture content, you are decreasing the moisture content and you are crossing over these boundaries. Now, when you have dried the soil mass, what is going to happen? This volume becomes constant. So, this much portion of the volume will be volume of air. Is this okay? Truly speaking, this graph is non-linear in nature, but this idealized form, this would be something like this in real life, but we idealize this as a constant value. So, this is the idealization. So, I have to define the shrinkage limit also. So, shrinkage limit is normally defined as S L and this is the moisture content as S L or W S you may write. This is a very interesting parameter which talks about the drying process of the soil and this is the state of the material where the soil remains saturated. This is the minimum moisture content present in the soil to make it saturated. That means, we do not allow any air to enter into the system. Normally, this type of testing is done under very slow conditions. We start from here, take a pat, make a slurry of the soil and normally we do not oven heat it. We keep it for air drying and sometimes once I have crossed the limit of the plasticity, I will keep it on the top of the oven, so that it gets heated up slowly. Fine. So, these are the <coughs> moisture contents which become benchmark moisture contents. So, truly speaking what we are doing is we are doing benchmarking of the soil mass. So, in whatever field of engineering and technology you are working, you have to consider the state of the material. And sometime back if you remember I had said the soil is a funny material, it can behave like a solid and it can behave like a liquid material. So, both the laws are valid, I can use solids mechanics, I can use fluid mechanics to model the state of the material. Is this okay? any questions? Now, what you have to do is you have to remember few things. The first concept is that uh, is something known as plasticity index. We call it as a PI, this is liquid limit minus plastic limit. Okay. Everything is in percentage. 
there is something known as the flow index. I hope you will realize after doing different types of classifications of soils, their origin, their deposition, geographical shape, morphology, mineralogy. Now, this is the first time we have started talking about the tamping which is given to the soil mass. So, this is a sort of an engineering property. You are inducing vibrations and you are trying to see what is the state of the material, whether this material becomes it loses strength, shear strength. Clear? You are inducing some tamping or the vibrations in the system. So, this is a sort of a mechanical property of the material, liquid limit. Here also you must have noticed in plastic limit, I was telling you that make take soil and roll it into threads. So, you are allowing deformations, very gentle deformation and heating from your fingers. Shrinkage limit. So, shrinkage limit is the one where the volume remains constant, there is no loss of moisture, soil remains saturated fully, no air enters into the pores. So, these are the basic assumptions which we use for defining the whole thing. All right. So, the slope of this line is known as velocity sorry uh, flow index. And normally we define this as I f. All right. Based on shrinkage limit, there is a classification of the soils because shrinkage limit is something which is normally used in engineering designs. So, if you have plasticity index. Uh, sorry, not uh, uh, shrinkage limit, uh, classification of the soil based on plasticity index, fine grained soils, remember. So, if it is 0, this is non plastic. 1 to 5, this is slight plastic, 5 to 10, low plastic, 10 to 20, medium plastic, 20 to 40, high plastic and greater than 40, it is a highly plastic material. Now, the tricks would be in your examination which you would be writing, uh, the examiner will not define any state of the material all right. He will simply say a soil of plasticity 10 to 20 and you assume the data, got it. So, these are the tricks where somebody will say the plasticity index is more than 40. So, it is understood that this material is going to be highly plastic and hence the settlements are going to be much more when the buildings are constructed on the top of this. Try to remember this part at least. Now, the question is about the shrinkage limit. Are you doing these experiments in that? Hmm? Determination of liquid limit, plastic limit and shrinkage limits? Not yet. Those of you who are very fascinated with THMC modeling, thermo hydromechanical coupling and all those new new concepts which are coming up in the market right now where the soil gets exposed to extreme heating conditions or extreme volumetric deformation because of air drying in a nuclear industry particularly. The shrinkage becomes very important that means, this is the state of the material where soil still remains saturated with a minimum moisture content 
and that is the fundamental attribute of the material. So, the models normally we use is uh, we have a two phase system, we have water, we have solids in the soils. Remember the soil is saturated, so this is the plastic state of the material where saturation is 100 percent, V 1 is the volume of the soil mass, W 1 is its weight and W s is the weights of the solid. This W s should not be confused with this W s, this is the moisture content, shrinkage limit. So, this is the W s weight of the solids. Now, if I slowly heat it, what happens is some amount of water goes out of the soil So, this portion becomes solids, volume does not change and here this is the reduced volume of water and suppose if I define this as V 2. the weight of the water is W W, weight of solid is W S and if I further dry it, what is going to happen is that this phase system will get converted to solids and air, the volume remains constant as V 2. Okay. So, these are the solids. this portion V s is not going to change further. This is what we define as V dry. Now, if you solve this three phase system and if I define the shrinkage limit as S L. There are two philosophies of uh, defining the shrinkage limit, one is weight wise, another one is volume wise. Uh, I am sure in your laboratory they will ask you to use the mercury column, what is known as mercury displacement. So, you dry the soil mass, the dried portion you put it in the mercury dash pot, whatever volume of the mercury oozes out, measure it that is equal to the weight of the soil all right and then put this pad into the oven and find out its moisture content so there are two ways of defining the shrinkage limit as i said shrinkage limit is a critical parameter and uh, what normally we do is we define shrinkage limit as w1 minus ws is the weight loss of water starting from V 1 to V 2 after this volume remains constant. So, V 1 minus V 2 is the total volumetric deformation. The amount of water which is gets spelled out is this much, this is the volume of water which has gone out all right due to drying. So, the weight of the solids would be W 1 sorry weight of the water would be W 1 minus W s and there is a loss of water which is taking place within the water itself to make system V 1 to V 2 correct. Is this okay? There are two processes, one is the water is evaporating out of the system, you are drying it. So, there is a loss in the water weight itself because of drying, solids remain as it is and there is a volume shrinkage which is taking place. So, these two effects have to be clubbed together. So, we can write this as W 1 minus W s minus gamma W V 1 minus V 2 divided by W s 
please make sure that this W s does not get reflected over here this is the weight of the solids. So, whatever way you define this is a shrinkage limit all right. So, I can weigh W 1 I can weigh W s I know the V 1 and V 2 by using the mercury pat and the weight of the solids is known I can get the shrinkage limit. Now, this process is normally or this equation is normally used when g is not known especially gravity. However, there is one way of finding out special gravity of the soils if you know the shrinkage limit and vice versa. In that case we utilize the concept of the volume. So, the shrinkage limit would be gamma w v 2 is the final volume of the soil mass minus weight of solids divided by g into gamma w upon w s. The way you would like to read it is final volume of v 2 and in this volume w s upon g gamma w is what this is the specific gravity of solids multiplied by the unit weight and this is the weight of the solids. Yes, so this is the volume of the soil mass at this stage at the shrinkage limit state divided by the weight of the solids. So, this equation is used when g is known. Mostly these equations are used for calibration of the g. Suppose there is a discrepancy in finding out the g and if shrinkage limit is known I can compute the specific gravity. So, these are class of problems which normally uh, are asked in your competitive exams. So, you should mug it up fine. There is something known as shrinkage ratio. which is defined as R s and this shrinkage ratio is defined in terms of the volume loss undergone by the material. So, I can say V 1 minus V 2 upon V 2 this is the percentage loss in the volume of soil mass from V 1 to V 2 divided by V 1 minus V 2 into gamma w upon weight of solids at this stage. So, this becomes the shrinkage ratio R s. If you solve this expression what you will be getting is you will be getting as weight of solids divided by gamma w into V 2. That means, after drying if I have achieved the state of volume V 2 I can substitute it over here W s is the weight of the solids I can dry the soil in oven I can compute W s gamma w is known. This term can also be written as 1 upon gamma w into W s upon V 2 all right. This is defined as apparent special gravity <coughs> weight upon volume is a density term and this is normalized by the unit weight of water. So, this becomes a apparent special gravity of the soil. 
try to correlate G and R, you will love to do it. G can be written as 1 upon 1 upon R s minus shrinkage limit divided by 100. As I said, uh, this function is used to calibrate the G value. It is a relationship between shrinkage limit and G. This shrinkage limit I have been defining as W s. Hope you have enough mathematics now. Start solving these problems, you will become an expert. Is this okay? Any questions? What you should learn in the laboratory is how to determine the moisture content number one. The first exercise you should do is compute moisture content by Owen method. Number two liquid limit of the soil, number three plastic limit of the soil, number four shrinkage limit of the soil. And when you are doing this matrix, you will come across the method which is also known as mercury displacement method. I hope you understand why mercury is being used to compute the weights of the solids because this is a non wetting fluid. Okay. So, I can displace the equal amount of the volume of the mercury which is the volume of the soil at the drying state, dried state or at the shrinkage limit state. I can compute the V 2 value, I can substitute it over here. Initial volumes are known, initial W 1 will be known. W s can be obtained and you can use this expressions. It's okay. The last part of today's discussion would be in 10 minutes I like to finish the classification of soils. This is based on plasticity index and for a quick review plasticity is the one uh, which dictates how easily the soil can be molded plastic material. Some of you might be using this term in structure analysis that plasticity of the system, plastic analysis, formation of hinges and virtual work principles and all those things. In geomechanics, we use this term plasticity index to define how easily a material can be molded, all right, it's clays. You just mix water and start playing with them. You know this. Uh, uh, molding clays are available in the market. You keep on playing with them, you keep on compressing, make chapati out of it or do whatever you want to make. So, this defines the state of the plasticity, how easily I can work on this material, how can, how much I can deform this, give it a shape. So, what we have done until now is, we have talked about the experiments which are done to characterize coarse grain materials and fine grain materials, all right. And then I would like to characterize the soils by putting them in a classification scheme. So, the classification schemes are known as it is a normally used for soils the first one is known as uscs unified soil classification system The second one is 
Astro. How many of you are doing transportation engineering course? All of you, third year. So, you must be aware of what is Astro, is it not? No? American Association of State Highway, State and Surface Transport Officials or Organization. Officials. Fine. The third one is, which is used in Indian context, we call it that ISSCS, Indian Standard Soil Classification System, Indian Standard Soil Classification System. All right. There is a small difference between USCS and ISSCS, we will discuss this today. The fourth one is what we call it as a USBR, this is based on the texture of the soil. not very much used in the engineering practice, but those of you who might be interested in tomorrow in agriculture engineering would be using it much more. So, this depends upon the texture of the soils. We talk about sand fraction, silt fraction and sand, silt and clay. So, this becomes a three dimensional graph, hope you know how to check the three dimensional graphs, is it not? <coughs> we normally do not use it in geomechanics. So, this 0 to 100, 0 to 100, 0 to 100, all right. Three dimensional plotting mostly. Now, the one which is used quite significantly in our context is the unified soil classification system. This is a graph between placity index versus moisture content and we use here the concept of A line. Now, A line is named after Arthur Casagrande. He is the guy who innovated this Arthur Casagrande, all right, 1948. And the equation for this A line is zero point seven three liquid limit minus twenty percent. So, that means, this line starts from there is a break over here, I will show you. So, this starts from 20 percent. The significant part of this USCS technique or the classification scheme is here we consider two types of moisture contents, one is greater than 50 percent and the another one is less than 50 percent. In Indian standard, what we do is, we have divided this category of two soils based on their moisture content in three parts. One is 50 percent, another one is 35 percent, that is the only difference. The A line remains same. This is A line this is the pi on the y axis. So, basically these plots are relationship between placity index and the moisture content. 
there are typical symbols which are used. So, the symbols which are written over here as per USCS classification, <coughs> G is used for gravels, S is used for sand, M is used for silt. In Swedish language, uh, silt is known as mo, and hence M is used. For clays, we use C. For organic matter, we used O, and PT is used for peats. So, this is the nomenclature which is used. This is followed by the subgroup we call them as suffix these are the prefixes. prefix and the suffix would be w is for well graded we discussed about this in the previous lecture what is a well graded material poorly graded material we use p for silty soil we use m so, M is for silt as well as for the silty material. For clay material, we use C. L is used for liquid limit, which is less than 50 percent, and H is used for liquid limit, which is more than 50 percent. So, suppose if I say GW. So, G w is a universal language which will be defining we read it from right hand side well graded gravel all right G p poorly graded gravels G m silty gravelly silty gravelly soil all right G c clay gravelly material all right so these are the combinations so what you are seeing in this uh, graph is so what you are observing here is there is a a line they are talking like u line doesn't matter this is the a line liquid limit versus plasticity index mh would be high liquid limit silt OH would be high liquid limit organic matter clear what you are observing here is a dual code C L M L. So, these are the soils which are not well defined by one scheme of classification. So, these are also known as interface soils what it indicates is the organic matter is always going to give more plasticity to the soil and hence you will observe most of the organic clays which are very notorious as far as infrastructure is concerned will show you very high plasticity index for a given liquid limit all right. So, you follow any standard textbook where you will get these type of relationships in quotes also these are the parts of the quotes where you can define the soil mass. Please remember when you use plasticity index and liquid limit this is for fine grained soil if I change this moisture content to liquid limit this becomes for fine grained material. So, these classification systems are for fine grained materials and for coarse grained material we have utilized C U C C by using D 10, D 60, D 30, 
d 85, d 15 and so on. All right. This becomes the common language which is used internationally to define the soil mass. Now, what remains here is uh, the ASHTO. ASHTO is normally being used by the transportation engineers. Very incomplete sort of a classification where they create a big index like uh, you know this is what is known as group index. Define is as G i and G i will be equal to some parameters multiplied by some coefficients. Do not try to remember all this plus so on where these parameters corresponds to different states of the material. All right. So, the thumb rule is if G i is very high it is not a good construction material. So, what we will do now is with this discussion we are going to define our soils mostly based on ISSCS and sometimes based on USCS. So, when you do research and when you publish papers in international arena, so their ISSCS is not known much. So, mostly international researchers they use the USCS classification scheme plot plasticity index with liquid limit and then classify the soil. As far as Indian practices are concerned, we follow ISSCS where we differentiate between high liquid limit and low liquid limit. So, high liquid limit is 50 percent and low liquid limit is 35 percent. So, in this graph what I was showing you MSCS type of a system, uh, you know this soil will become low liquid limit organic matter, low liquid limit silt, high liquid limit organic matter C H. Now, tomorrow when you come across these terms as a practicing engineer you should be knowing how this material is going to behave. So, the moment M S C H comes in the picture a geotechnical engineer becomes quite happy. Why? because everybody cannot deal with it except for him or her and this becomes your speciality. So, most of the money which comes out of the profession in the art of consulting is when you deal with the soils which are above a line got it. So, these are the challenging problematic soils which we are talking about highly plastic material they will shrink deform settlements will be there. You remember the slides which I had shown you the type of distresses that the system undergoes would be in the soils which are sitting at the same liquid limit, but with very high plasticity index. Now, how to negotiate with the situation is a is an art that we will be studying slowly.